How are you? Welcome to Critical Moves of the Lesur. Once again, we're going to be discussing the dispute between China and the United States. Now, in the context of the COVID-19, what does each part say? Who is uh, really winning this battle? What are the implications? of this dispute between two of the most powerful countries in the world. Let's begin. Let's recall how uh, the, the Trump administration has been speaking of the expansion of the COVID-19. We will also see what has been the answer of the Chinese government. China is saying something that is false, that our people have taken the virus to the Chinese. Instead of discussing that, we should say where it comes from. It came from China. The accusation of the United States against the United States is made out of nothing. It's totally unfounded, and it's not necessary to answer it. This, uh, this attack of, of, uh, against China is irresponsible. It is not being truthful. Even experts uh, have said that they have doubts about it. China will never admit it, and they will oppose firmly on, the, uh, on all of the measures of the Trump administration. I call upon all of the people of, of of the Trump administration to focus on solving the COVID and not to deviate the attention. Such intentions would not help the United States to handle their internal um, epidemic and will only hinder the fight of China against, this, uh, of this, against the virus. Let's locate the, the map on which both countries are uh, struggling. China and the U.S., COVID in numbers. Up until April 20th, COVID-19 has left 165 people dead. 2.4 million are infected all around the world, and 642,000 have recovered. According to the World Health Organization alert, the pandemony is in, a, in the apex uh, phase. Initially, the COVID-19 was located in Wuhan, that is part of Hubei province. The country led the numbers of people infected by being the epicenter of the disease. However, after all of the good measures that were taken by Chinese government that go by social isolating, closing frontiers, and suspending all of the air flights, China was able to stop the, uh, and reduce the number of people infected. Up until 20, April 20th, 82,747 cases have been confirmed, of which 77,062 uh, have recovered, 1,031 are still active, and 4,632 deaths are recorded. In the United States, the, difference, the situation is totally different. Since uh, Trump did not take into account all of the recommendations of the World Health Organization and did not take all the prevention measures. So up until April 20th, we have 778,000 positive cases, more than 41,000 people dead. And this is goes beyond uh, many other countries that are also strictly affected by the countries. It is 35% of all of the people confected are in the United States. This has not only uh, affected the medical system, uh, it's important to say that the medical, the medical personnel does not have the basic protection. And uh, eco in the economic front, we have that all of, those, all of the exchange tables have, uh, have fallen, and 17 million have lost their, their jobs. Now, what is the, what is the U.S. policy uh, in terms of what the international organisms has been? So let's analyze this. Ever since he took office in January 2017, Donald Trump has opted for, for cutting any bilateral relationships. This, is a, this goes with his, uh, with his, with his, with his uh, logo that is America First. Just short after he began, he, he cut the transatlantic uh, agreement. Then in June of the same year, Trump decided to put his back on the 
Paris, Paris Accord of, of its environmental defense, where 195 other countries do participate. And uh, the reason is that he wants to protect the United States. In October, he went through with his, with his threat, saying that he is going to uh, withdraw by, from UNESCO. This organization was originally created by the United States, and he says that there are uh, irregularities on the economic front. Seven months later, in May 2018, the president announced that his country would withdraw from the nuclear agreement with Iran. For this, he raised false accusation against the country. What they say is that Tehran was uh, doing enrichment, which was not true. This was uh, proven by the energy, atomic energy uh, organization that revealed that Iran was going forth with its part ever since uh, Trump has only incremented his hostilities against Iran. Then he also an announced that he was going to withdraw from the United Nations human, human rights mechanism of United Nations. This decision was taken after the High Commissioner's Office of United Nations for Human Rights criticized the situation of the children being uh, being taken away from their from their parents by the United States government. Less than a year later, Trump suspended the, the participation in the medium-range nuclear uh, weapons, which had been signed in 1986 by Russia and the United States in the midst of the government of Ronald Reagan. He justified his withdrawal with the false accusations against Moscow, Moscow, saying that they were violating the treaty. Trump has shown that he has no will to work in bilateral organizations. And now in the midst of the COVID-19, he decided to withdraw all of the support to the World Health Organization. He accuses this organization for having a bad, a bad performance and that they responsible for the expansion of the coronavirus. It is, uh, it is estimated that it's 15% of all of the whole financing of the United States. The suspension of these funds may bring severe consequences for the World Health Organization and the mechanisms to confront the COVID-19. Now, let's go back to uh, something that we heard at the beginning. Uh, why don't you see what Telesur says uh, today? China, call, China calls on the U.S. not to promote conspiracy theories. The Foreign Affairs spokesperson condemns on calling on the U.S. people that uh, they are they are trying to they are trying to accuse China for being responsible of the pandemonium after all of these accusations of President Trump and Mike Pence about how the the Bio, bio defense lab had been the where it was created. They, this person says that the origin of the of the virus should be determined by specialists. And this would be a conspiracy theory. And he also says that the proliferation of those who are responsible of spreading these theories are are trying to harm their country. He also said that it's inappropriate the, the accusations of a, of a high official of the White House saying that China has taken advantage of the situation to have an advance in their economy. They say that between April 17, and March 1st and April 17, China has given uh, more than 258 million pairs of gloves and 29 million protective gear, among other equipment. Let's uh, continue with Guerrillero, that is of April 21st. China confronts three enemies, the pandemony, United States, and the disinformation. Well, nobody almost speaks well of the United States, of China. And when they speak of them is to discredit everything that, uh, that China has done. And Beijing demands to stop with this conspiracy theory with political objectives. The accusations of White House have also been, have been rejected by the international scientific community, such as 
Anthony Fauci, Anthony Fauci the director of the, of the health organization for White House, also rejected in a press conference the theory uh, that the new coronavirus was, uh, was made in a laboratory. Uh, um, Nature Medicine magazine has said that many investigators will say that uh, SARS and COVID-2, as well as other infection diseases, say that none of the scenarios of being a, a laboratory fabricated would be, uh, would be viable. Uh, let me suggest uh, the, this article that's called Crisis of COVID-19. Will it tip the balance on in fourth of, of China? It was published in Lisfan TV. Going through of this, it says that the new dispute between the uh, United States and China is a battle that will transform the global power in favor of China, the world after the COVID-19 will be very different to the one we saw before. Uh, but one of the clear realities is a big breach between Pekin and Washington and the reorganization of the world order. Everything that the White House has done with the COVID-19 has unleashed in the United States how, Im how important the Chinese influence is in the U.S. because the numbers reflect how 80 percent of the medicine that is used in the United States comes from Chinese companies. The monopoly of the production of PPE of China has frustrated both the U.S. government and has taken the, this government to try to do a modern piracy where they the, where they use the Wild West to take over this PPE that is so necessary. China has showed that there is a great control in their in, in controlling this pandemonium. And they have announced that they are going back to normality and it has been so efficient that some have expressed their skepticism of uh, how Pekin has been able to control this epidemic. Central Bank of China has not yes you had not not yet used the, the, all of their mechanisms to confront the recession that is upcoming according to the, to the, reserve, to the to international organisms. Meanwhile, United States is trying, to, is trying to use their own money to avoid any recession. So China is much more prepared to, to support any other countries um, in the economic front uh, than any other country in Europe or United States. In Latin America, China has signed many agreements to develop mining companies and buying uh, the oil on behalf of China has been very important in the cooperation with the government of Venezuela. China has shown once again that they are ready to carry out this role in the world with this mega, mega project of the route of the silk. Pekin is not, does not only want to interfere in internal affairs, but they also insist that they should that every country should maintain their sovereignty. As I said before, this article is, uh, is very interesting and you should go through it. Let's go to Beijing with Irancy Peraza. She's our, she's our correspondent over there. Greetings. Uh, China apparently is the enemy that the United States needs to deviate the attention with their internal crisis and with their total unsuccessful attitude with coronavirus. This, has, uh, this, this strategy has revealed the inefficiency of the, of the security uh, services that the United States has based on, on just having economic revenue. However, Washington keeps on blaming third parties of this disaster. They also are trying to blame China for the disaster they have. However, they are not able to show any scientific evidence. Washington high officials insist that this new coronavirus 
came from a Chinese laboratory, and they tried to insist uh, China on the appearance of this new coronavirus. Likewise, they insist that there is a governmental plan on behalf of China to cover up the fabrication of this new coronavirus, and that this plan is supported by the World Health Organization. We must say that China and the international health community have totally rejected these accusations which are only based on speculations and have no proof or no scientific evidence to prove the international community. Because uh, what they're doing is just like in the Cold War, the United States has even has even pushed it, it has even mentioned that China took a, carried out in 2019 a, a nuclear test in a, in a center of China, and that's saying that it was United States who in 2019 annulled uh, the, nuclear, the nuclear weapons uh, treaty. By leaving this treaty, Experts have said they opened the door for a, for a new weapons war among the biggest powers in the world. All of these accusations that have been la launched by the United States to other countries, especially against China, have reached a, in a, at a point where this country is living one of the, their worst sanitary crises in their recent history. Up until now, there are more than 40,000 dead people in the United States. However, the White House insists to insist on accusing China of their internal problems. Beijing has has uh, rejected this constantly, and what they say is that they should uh, that United States should pay attention in solving their own problems and uh, stop using the China as a smoke a smoke curtain to cover their own problems. This is all what we can report. Back to you. Thank you very much, Iramsi. We're going to mark our first pause. But remember, uh, as always, we have a question of the day. China is trying to look for the cure of COVID-19, not only for China, but for the rest of the world. The government of Donald Trump is trying to blame this country of everything that's going wrong. Who is, who is right in this? Participate. We would like to hear from you. We'll be right back. The attacks of the U.S. government towards China have gotten even worse in the, in the midst of the COVID crisis. The accusations of the origin of this virus and the attack on Chinese officials have, are part of the most recent actions of Washington against China. Ever since there was this burst of the COVID in the United States, President Trump went against China, speculating on the origin of this virus. Every time on his, on his press briefings, he has referred to the pandemonium as the China virus, and they threatened he threatened China of consequences should it be proven that China was responsible for the outburst of this virus and that it was not only a mistake. China has accused uh, the Chinese government of hiding information by defying in, through his, uh, through his account, account, saying that the numbers in China are not real. To these uh, accusations, we can say that he went against um, uh, he went against some journalists, uh, Chinese journalists that were working in the U.S. He assures that uh, the international 
help includes the United States. China has demanded to put an end of the conspiracy theory with political objectives about the COVID-19. Element, the necessary elements to start our analysis and critical moves. We have Enrique Dulce from Mexico. He's an expert in uh, international international affairs. And we have Ignacio Virragan also. I would like to thank you both uh, for coming to our space. Professor Dussel, I would like to start with you. Uh, we could practically say that we are saying that there's a, there is a, a fight between a lion and a monkey, and the monkey is stripped to a tree. So um, I would like to start our analysis with you. Why? Because being in Mexico, based in Mexico, that is bordered with the United States, can also give us a better vision of, uh, of what this relationship has been, if we can call it relationship between the United States and China. And now these relationships are most tense than ever before. Professor. Hi. Um, I send you a big hug uh, in the midst of this sanitary emergency. Well, I would, uh, I would like to recall the tense relationships between the United States and China before the COVID emergency. In this academic network of the world, we have analyzed this topic of how China, ever since 2013, has has, um, has proposed a globalization system with characteristics of the Chinese government uh, as opposed to the globalization uh, project of the United States and how. Four years later, in 2017, the United States being the, the old rich person has, uh, has taken a very aggressive reaction against this attitude of China and is establishing this concept of a, of a competition between two great powers and, uh, and a very aggressive uh, response. And this, uh, what we have is that they have uh, an exclusively re a relationship. So either you're with China China or you're with us. And this in 2020 has become even more evident with the uh, elections in November 2020. These are presidential, uh, these are presidential elections. And this uh, COVID crisis that has that has hit the United States much, much worse than in any other country. And uh, here, uh, the Trump administration has launched uh, many, many accusations that are not fundamented, beginning by uh, saying that this is the Chinese disease and inventions that uh, this is a result of a Chinese laboratory. So I think that it's very important to put everything in its fair dimension. Uh, this is like five or ten years of tension between these two great countries that is carried out in, in culturally, in the economic front, in institutional front, and in 2020 is now totally revealed. And the tensions are very, very relevant. So, Professor, uh, I would like to see how there was a change. There was a change of, of direction at the beginning of the year, in the first days of January, when they met uh, with uh, Chinese officials uh, and in the United States to sign that beginning of agreement where they were going to stop the commercial war. And then Donald Trump says that everything is doing well. However, just a couple days after, there was this tragedy in Wuhan and it starts to spread. And the United States, uh, and the United States says something totally different 
than what he did, what he said before. Well, I would just like to reiterate that in 2020, and from a perspective, a short-term perspective, and in the midst of this uh, tragedy, and uh, with the upcoming elections, it's it's very hard, almost impossible, to understand the change of mood and strategy of the presidency of the United States. President Trump has uh, has pointed out that uh, Xi Jinping is his friend. He has also said the same of the of his friend uh, of the president of Mexico. But five minutes later, he will he will stick a knife in your back, and he says that he wants to visit the Wuhan laboratories because most probably the COVID was made there. And if it's and if that this is so, you will see the consequences. So uh, these are awful accusations with very important implications. And I'm I'm afraid to say that from here till November 2020, considering that the popularity of the president is um, is diminishing. And this is obviously a result of uh, the lack of action that the United States showed when the COVID was appearing. So what he wants is to be reelected no matter what. So he's going to attack anybody to make himself the hero of this. So of course these are un unfortunate situation in the midst of this uh, of this crisis. What the United States is doing, he's accusing uh, accusing other countries. He's uh, blackmailing the World Health Organization. He's attacking the World Health Organization. I think this will go in crescendo in the upcoming months. Thank you, Professor Ignacio. Um, I'm sorry that I made you wait, but uh, now I want to analyze the discourse, this, uh, this analysis of the linguistic part. In respect to the way uh, that that China has, uh, how has China re reacted to these, all of these offenses that the United States has done? You as a connoisseur of this culture, how would you value it? Well, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to participate in your program. Uh, I am so pleased to participate with you and along with Enrique Dulcel Peter, who is on the other side of the line. And he is a he is a specialist on the Chinese studies. Well, here from Argentina, we are we are following the the news, and we're seeing the the exchange of accusation. And I think the most that caught my eye was this declaration of the spokesperson of the Foreign Minister Affairs of China when when he was responding to the first accusation to Robert O'Brien saying that that this uh, virus had been developed in a Chinese uh, laboratory and he makes this counter accusation saying that there were U.S. military that could have been those who spread the original virus. So this is the truth of post-truth. And these are accusations that are that have no fun, uh, fun, foundations. There is a big uh, consensus that it's practically impossible to manipulate a virus to develop to these stages. There is a basic consensus in the biological science saying that it's practically impossible. However, these theories, these conspiracy theories keep on circulating and they are they are echoed all through the most uh, the lower levels of society, and uh, many many news organizations have also repeated them. In this sense, I think that taking this uh, this declaration of uh, of China that was. 
That was unfounded. In most of the cases, China has responded with a lot of demure. And what they're trying to do is to stop the intensity of this conflict. And what they're doing is to establish their own line of communication. And uh, what they're doing, of course, is that they're triumphing over this battle of COVID-19, and we're also in the possibility of giving to the, the rest of the world um, many suggestions and best experience that they have acquired after th what they've gone through. And what we see is that great part of, uh, of what China is now producing is all of the equipment needed to combat the COVID-19. And they are also, they are also giving donations, uh, soft loans, and uh, so in other parts of the world, they can keep on fighting COVID-19. In the midst of all of this, there's a lot of symbolism, Ignacio, and which has to do with Wuhan, that was the first epicenter of, uh, of this pandemic, has now lifted their, their quarantine, while now the, the epicenter of, uh, of COVID is in New York, where things are getting worse. Symbolically, how do you see this? Well, I think to analyze the symbolic uh, spectrum of this is uh, there's a triumph of China of, uh, over the COVID and contrasted with the uh, inability of the U.S. To, to control their sanitary system. Of course, we must understand that their sanitary systems are totally different. Uh, there are there are Andrew Cuomo, for example, the governor of New York. There has been uh, there has been a dispute between uh, the governor of New York and the president of the states, where uh, they've been discussing how far each one can go. And in this sense, the dynamic between the federal and the, the state level becomes a bit more complex. In the United States, on the contrary, has a centralized system that is founded on, uh, on strong state organizations and institutions. And there's a, an, an only party, and this facilitates uh, the make, taking of decisions and establishing policies where in the United States it's much harder to carry out. Well, uh, you've spoken of a very interesting aspect that of, a, of this dispute that goes beyond the dispute of the United States and China, but also the political formation, like the one of communism and capitalism, on the other hand. Uh, in the next part of our interview, this is what we're going to be talking about. So I invite you both uh, to stay with us. When we come back after the pause, we will keep on analyzing this topic. And for you, the viewers, don't forget that we have the question of the day. China is looking for the cure of COVID-19, not only for the Chinese, but for the rest of the world. Why Donald Trump is focusing on blaming China of everything that's going wrong in the United States. Who's right, who's wrong? We would like to hear from you. We'll be right back. In the midst of a campaign of the White House against China, the huge country of Asia is showing how they have recovered from the pandemony. April 8th, the, the citizens of Wuhan, that was the first epicenter of the COVID, celebrated the first minutes of the lifting of the quarantine after the local government had lifted the restrictions to leave the city. After 11 weeks of the confinement, local authorities uh, are trying to go back to normality step by step during the worst stages of, of the COVID. Everything was stopped and more than 40,000 uh, doctors were sent to the place. 
la campaña local this de local China campaign China uh, to fight the COVID keeps on demanding very important economic and scientific resources. Uh, China has also cooperated with, uh, with personnel and equipment to other countries. What they're doing is fighting COVID-19 beyond their borders. And in the midst of this, they are being attacked by the United States about a alleged uh, mismanagement of this uh, disease. While the priority for China is to, to cure everybody, the United States is blaming them on the development of the, of the COVID itself. Let's not forget that now United States is the epicenter of the COVID-19 with over 40,000 dead. Donald Trump has announced that there is going to be a, a restriction on people that are going to go into the United States. There has been economic measures to try to calm and stabilize Wall Street. For example, there has been an emergency declaration on a national level. And what this does is to have, be able to use uh, state funds. Many people are not covered by any type of sanitary help. For example, all of the migrants. While the numbers of the, of the people that are dead and, and infected uh, are increased, it is not clear what is the plan of the United States to combat the disease. So what we can see is that there's an upcoming disaster. What is the concrete plan of the U.S. government? This is the question. This is what we're going to be asking my, my guests. Let's begin with Enrique Dulce. He's, he's the Mexico-China Research Center. Professor Dussel, uh, you were speaking of an idea that I would like to go back to, that this year is the electoral, system, electoral process in the U.S., and it's also important to see what is the, the plan of Donald Trump for his re-election. Well, from what I've been able to review, I am totally integrated in this topic. I just came back uh, in a semester in Pittsburgh University. And I came back due to this pandemony just a couple of weeks ago. But of course, I would say that the plan is uh, very uncertain. The objective is clear, is to become reelected, regardless of what it takes. The plan is to go on a day-to-day -day basis, seeing what, is the, what are the most relevant topics, and to increase his popularity among the U.S. electorate. Of course, it will be incredibly hard, because according to the International Monetary Fund, just a couple of days ago, says that in 2020, the U.S. economy will fall uh, to less 5.8%. Percent. This is a this is a dramatic fall, and to try to be reelected in this uh, in this environment will be very difficult. It's in, it must be observed that uh, we are just about to see who is going to pay for the cost of this pandemic. The government of the United States has approved. Uh, a stimulus package, but also in the health uh, process, it's a 9.5 percent of the internal of their internal revenue. But who is going to pay for this? This 9.5 of the internal revenue at a at an unemployment rate that will go up to 20 percent. So uh, we are speaking of a huge uh, crisis where, of course, nobody wants to be responsible, least of all the Trump administration, and nobody wants to pay for the bill of this. So of course it's going to be a very complex year. And, it's, and it will be, there will be aggression against those who are, who are the hands of, uh, of Donald Trump, whoever this might be. It can be immigration, China, Mexico, Venezuela, whoever is at his reach up until November 2020. Well, since you mentioned Russia, Professor Dusseldorf, uh, it's interesting how in the recent months this uh, Russia phobia that has been 
Commission that has been pushed forward after the impeachment. It has been, this has been totally silenced. So we're, we would like to know what the Democratic Party is thinking. Well, of course, the counterpart of the Democratic Party is just as interested as the Trump administration in winning the 2020 elections. Uh, surprisingly, I would say, and the, the pre-electoral the pre-electoral stages have come to an end to determine who is going to be the democratic candidate who is now joe biden and it's uh, for me it, it's interesting that joe biden himself and the democratic party has been very quiet with all of the accusations of the united states uh, well, of Trump with, in many aspects. Uh, let's not forget that it's not only China what they're saying, what they're attacking. Just yesterday, they have imposed restrictions on letting migrants coming in to the United States. And let's not forget, the United States is a migrant country. And the Democratic Party has said nothing about this. They will have to take some initiative that would be more active in this front. Thank you, Professor. You were also saying a line that uh, I would like to keep on analyzing now, and it has to do with... Uh, with uh, establishing once again this capitalism versus uh, uh, communism. Do you think we're going back to those years when, when, the, that there, when there was a bipolarity of the world, when chi communist China existed, but it was not as relevant as it is today? And now we see the United States as the leader of capitalism. And what, of course, they, are, they carry out the imperialism based on capitalism, confronted with China, that according to their communist philosophy is carrying out a socialism that is centered on the human being. On, on everything that has to do with community and going beyond the borders with their solidarity. So nowadays there is a there is a dispute of this of these principles. Well, I think it's very interesting to to see how these model of productions are are incarnated in 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 both countries. So to break this. Uh, this bilateral way of seeing the pandemony, I think it's important to see that there has been many aspects in this dispute that has to do with what there are limitations to the personal freedoms as opposed to as opposed to looking towards the, the commonwealth. And of course, that implies some uh, restrictions. Uh, of course, China is a, is a state where their political system tends towards the socialism. However, it's not the only government that has been able to impose some measures to protect the well-being of the majority of their population by cutting in, uh, individual liberties. This, uh, this goes in terms of, of the use of public space and then many other aspects. So I would say that the model, the economic productive model of China is very particular, but it has these, these aspects. On one hand, the United States, beyond being a system where they have a very strong ideology, un desarrollo, un esfuerzo individual, ¿no? Se llevar adelante 
where they where the individual liberties are the main motors but of course what we see is that they have great shortcomings in, in aspects like the public health because not everybody has a uh, has health coverage and this is a thought of for those who can contribute and have these limitations. So, of course, there has been a, a dispute on how far the federal government and the state government can go and who is going to test uh, for the COVID and who's going to give the who's going to give treatment for COVID. So, in this sense, there are still debating back and forth. What what can be the, the extent of and who's going to pay the bills for all of this uh, for all this disaster <coughs> and why should uh, should these be privately covered while in China as well as in other European countries uh, such as the European countries the possibility of is there of of saying well well, the common interest must go above and beyond um, all of the profits of those who give uh, medicine services. So these would be like two aspects. However, um, of course, China doesn't want to bring back the Cold War. But, well, my, my personal point of view, I would say that these personal uh, liberties could be stopped uh, where uh, to have to have the, the common good at, at an eye. <coughs> I would like to ask you something else. As a connoisseur of the Chinese reality, I invite you in one minute to define what is this political formation of China with Chinese characteristics and that has become a cliche that not many can define. Well, to be brief, uh, the Chinese characteristics we can say that that they promote a multilateralism in their international relationships and concrete actions like the, the Silk Route to consolidate an integration space and also a goodwill political relationship. And this would go uh, uh, in their surroundings and would reach all through Europe. And this uh, foreign policy of China would also create many instances where the objectives of China could be negotiated with the interests of other actors. In general, um, we can say that it's less real, this, uh, this Chinese reality. Uh, and uh, they are not willing to impose themselves like the United States does do. So it's important to see that uh, China is interconnected with many other communities. And we have this common, uh, what they believe is it a common purpose of humanity. And there's, uh, there's also an effort to build categories of analysis based on the Chinese reality. So what they're trying to do is to construct not only a reality, but also the, the research platform to go forward with this Chinese dream. Their dream is to acquire the capacities so the Chinese population can have a prosperous life. Ever since some years, uh, China has eradicated poverty. 
in the recent years, and they have had an economic development that has benefited the, the middle class of China. And so these would be the, the axis of, the, of what China believes in and how they're acting. And all of the in Chinese investment in improving the lifestyle of, of the people and many macroeconomic uh, aspects that are under the vigilance of the, of the government, like strategic investment, uh, investment in other countries, in banking and financial systems. So in that sense, there, is ma there are many elements that make this uh, socialism with Chinese characteristic, which is a project that is in development. There is a plan, as we said, but of course there are some adjustments that come from the contingency. Thank you very much, Ignacio, for your explanation. And last but not least, Prestel Dus Professor Dussel, in 30 seconds, can you please answer the following question? Who has it more clear in this context of the pandemonium of COVID-19? The Chinese model or the U.S. model? Well, what happens is in time and space, it doesn't, it, you can't copy paste. The rest of the world cannot copy paste the Chinese experience. I would say that the the main characteristic of China ever since Deng Xiaoping, uh, like 40 years ago, is the, is the presence of the public sector in all aspects of the country. This cannot be replied in Latin America, in Europe, or in other countries. So, our Latin America, I would say that unfortunately, the pandemony is reflecting that the king king or queen are, are nude, they're naked. So we can't even produce masks. You would say that anybody could make it in their country. No, in their house. We have to, we have to import them from China or somewhere else. So welcome to the conditions of subdevelopment of Latin America. And this with great levels of polarization where there are differences all over. Thank you very much, Professor, for your time to Critical Moves of Telesur. Let's go to our commercial break. Facts than more than allegations. While President Trump spends a lot of time to accuse China on the expansion of COVID-19, China is fighting with in three aspects: the sanitary aspect by holding back and extinguishing the pandemony in the territory. The second one, the scientific one, trying to find the cure, the cure for this. And the third one, the international one, while trying to help other countries to give assistance on the medical, on the medical front with equipment. This including with the United States, facts more than allegations. This is all for today. Thank you very much.